India, land of mystery, is the seventh largest land mass and second most populated nation in the world. resources and manpower, yet its people are among the poorest and most suffering on earth. Millions of Indians suffer from malnutrition, disease and poverty. The people are apathetic because their religion has taught them to be detached observers, disregarding the agonizing lifestyle which imprisons them. Yes, Naipul, himself an Indian, describes India as a wounded civilization paralyzed by her religious beliefs. This complex and contradictory religion known as Hinduism promotes the worship of enlightened godmen called gurus. And countless idols. deifies both nature and femaleness and believes mother goddess to be the original deity. She is worshipped in many forms, as mother India venerated in the shape of her map, as mother earth reverenced in the cow whose urine is even seen as sacred. In goddess Kali, the goddess of death and destruction, who demands to be pacified with blood sacrifices. And in Holy Mother Ganges, the largest river in India. This river is worshipped by millions who flock to her banks to perform daily toiletries and annually dump hundreds of thousands of dead bodies to assure them of a better reincarnation. Its pollution does not dampen the spiritual fervor of the people who believe its waters to be essential for all religious ceremonies and imbued with magical and healing powers. Incredibly, the West is today looking to Hinduism's superstitions for hope. The religion that has all but destroyed India has now infiltrated every area of Western society. Protesting that it is not religious but scientific, it is transforming our minds, science, medicine, mass media, politics, and the church. Hinduism is most seductive when it wears the mask of Christian terminology and has shockingly managed to disguise itself as the latest Christian thought. Hundreds of thousands of Western pilgrims have journeyed to India seeking enlightenment and have disappeared by the hundreds. Too often they are destroyed by the madness and perversion of the very gurus they have worshipped and looked to for salvation. Here 
in Delhi, India, Guru Darshan Singh, only one of hundreds of gurus, has personally converted or initiated some 15,000 followers. He explains that it is the job of the guru to groom his disciples into the shortest path to salvation. Salvation is the same, but you know, we have various paths leading to it. You know, some of the paths are long paths, other paths are the short paths. Why is a master then necessary? Master is necessary, you know, to groom you into the shortest path. Descended from a long line of Hindu spiritual masters, Rabindranath Maharaj is a former guru and accomplished yogi who was worshipped by thousands. In his autobiography, Escape into the Light, he tells of his life as a guru and why he abandoned Hinduism. The Hindu needed to be near his guru. The Hindu needed to consult his guru. He eventually saw his guru as the only means to salvation. It is absolutely extraordinary also to look at disciples of some of these gurus that I saw in India, for example. These adoring, huge, open eyes that just will accept anything from him and that just love him beyond anything. I loved Maharishi. I worshipped him. Therefore, everything he said or did or thought was perfectly right in my eyes. I just met Bhagwan and there it was. It's nobody else than him. Bhagwan is my master and I love him. I'm in love with him. That's the only thing I can say. Guru Bhagwan Rajneesh, given refuge by the American government after fleeing his native India, has purchased a 100 square mile ranch in central Oregon, to which his red clad disciples flock from all over the world. whose astonishing title literally means highest spiritual teacher, lord of the universe, honorable sir and king. Carol Matriciana is a journalist and author of the book Gods of the New Age. Born and raised in India, she moved to London in 1973 where she became one of England's leading authorities on new religious movements. During the various celebrations in Oregon, Rajneesh comes out in one of his Rolls Royces two or three times a day and is worshipped, literally adored, by his thousands of Western followers. It is so saddening to see their devotion for a mere human being who considers himself God and their submission to his spiritual rules like wearing his picture around their neck continually, or wearing various shades of red always, or changing their names to Indian ones. His spokeswoman and right-hand lady, Sheila Silverman, tries to explain the attraction and magnetism of her master. He is something, uh, something that is so, I have no words. It is a love relationship. Master and disciple. Something happens in your heart when you see a master. <laughs> Bhagwan's my master. <laughs> Back in India, the proceedings are on a much larger scale. Here at the Kumbh Mela Festival or Aquarian Fair in Allahabad, India, 20 million Hindus gather to witness an endless procession of hundreds of these self-proclaimed God-men.
dirt beneath these gurus' feet is an aid to the disciple in his quest for salvation. This footage was covertly photographed and smuggled out of India. Naked priests are considered to be the holiest and most dedicated of guru disciples. Many cover their bodies with cremation ashes and dirt and mat cow dung into their hair. Some are armed and are dependent upon extremely potent drug concoctions. They have surrendered everything, families, possessions, and even their minds, becoming literally insane out of devotion to their guru. Well, guru is the, our best friend, philosopher, and guide, and he shows the way to God. So, uh, we in our India acknowledge him as a divine power, just equivalent to God. If anyone could be near the beloved master and witness the love, the compassion, the humility, the grace, the generosity. No one in his right mind would not know that this is a walking, talking, living God on earth. In all scriptures you will find that the master is the God incarnated power working on earth. You people that interviewed this gentleman today, I don't think you knew who you interviewed, but you interviewed God. For the Hindu, the guru is all important. The guru is his Lord, his Master, his Savior, even greater than God. Yes, Guru is greater than God. The Guru concept represents within Hinduism the personal dimension which God represents within Christianity. I have personally talked with many, many Gurus and the sad fact is that within their belief system they have to be detached and removed from their emotions and compassion and their cruelty and inhumaneness is seen as spiritual and excused as holy. I was really interested in their worship and their veneration and their adoration and the gifts and offerings they brought to me. But I was certainly not interested in their problems and their difficulties and hardships and pains. The Guru followers believe that he returns this incredible love that they feel towards him. But in reality, he feeds off their emotions to maintain his own ego. So many people come here because they too are in love with Bhagwan. They too are seeking the wisdom, the love that Bhagwan has to offer. He has so much love and he gives his love to everybody and it helps us to, to find our love in ourselves. The followers of Jim Jones, leader of the People's Temple, were convinced that their relationship was built on love. And nearly 1,000 of his devoted disciples committed suicide at his command. It was their final gift of total surrender to the leader they loved. Their lives cut short by a madman claiming to be God, the reincarnation of Jesus Christ. Guru Sai Baba is one of India's most powerful men with millions of Indian disciples and a growing Western following. He says of himself, I am God. My power is divine and has no limit. There is no force, natural or supernatural, that can stop me or my mission. Today, hundreds of these professing godmen are invading the West. Is there any need for a law? Or should we continue to welcome these gods of the new age? Prabhu Guptara, born and raised in India, is currently a journalist and media commentator in London. Gurus are going to the West because of two reasons. First, of course, they want to convert people. Uh, they want them to become followers of their own religion, in some cases themselves. And secondly, because they feel they have something to offer. What these gurus have to offer is a family, a community to belong to, which they don't have. Thousands of seekers, most of them from broken or unstable families, and already emotionally wounded, are becoming victims of the gurus. 
Dr. Oz Guinness, an Oxford scholar and noted world lecturer, is author of the bestseller, Dust of Death. One of the deepest longings in the modern world is for a sense of meaning and belonging, sense in their lives and sort of stability in their worlds. And people having not found that in the West are hungry for it. And reacting against the West, they're backing into the arms of the East without looking at it straight. Ed Senesi is a former member of the International Society of Krishna Consciousness, known as the Hare Krishna Movement. For three years, he was editor-in-chief of their magazine, Back to Godhead. The attitude toward the family in the Hare Krishna Movement is very unfortunate. The family is seen more or less as a necessary evil. Eckhart Floter, a successful German journalist, became a devoted disciple of Rajneesh in 1979 and spent several months with him in India. Rajneesh clearly says that the family, that marriage, that all these traditional family bonds are rotten. The only relationship that counts is between his disciples and him. Kathy, devoted disciple of Maharishi Mahesh Yogi for 15 years, was a teacher and governor of Transcendental Meditation, known as TM. I thought TM was strengthening my family, but it was really weakening it because I was turning all my attention in on myself if you have an allegiance to your wife or your children, to the extent that you have that dedication to those people, you are less dedicated to the organization. I either had to become a member so I could go with him, or he was going to divorce me because he was not supposed to have any outside attachments. He said it wasn't that he didn't love me anymore, and in fact he still loved me very much. It's just that I was only human, and Bhagwan was superhuman, and therefore he was more deserving of my husband's love than I was. How many of these people loved their neighbor, their family, in this totally giving way? How Alexandra Schmidt is one of France's leading experts on new religious movements. How many have been so blind to, to all the negative aspects of a the person they loved as to that of the guru? Ellen is a spokeswoman for the Brahma Kumaras Raja Yoga Organization which is completely administered by women who control 800 centers in 40 countries. Our organization has the practice amongst all the participants of celibacy, um, whether in individuals or married couples. I found myself being attracted to my wife, but I couldn't because as soon as I felt attracted to her emotionally, physically, then it was difficult for me to maintain my celibacy. So the way I resolved that was to turn her into an object of, of dislike or hate. We have living proof of thousands of couples who are living in this way and are finding much greater harmony and pure love as opposed to limited physical love. Over 90% of the marriages in the Krishna movement end in divorce. Rather than using our energy in raising a family and being involved in many physical relationships, we're focusing that energy on spirituality. You see, what's so diabolical about all this is that it masquerades as spirituality. In some schools of thought, to be spiritual, celibacy is encouraged, and yet in others, sexual perversion is practiced, not only among the gurus themselves, but by their disciples, including young children. Contradictions are also seen in the attitude towards women who, on the spiritual level, are the focus of worship. Their femaleness is seen as the creative power of God. For instance, to be initiated by a female yogini is considered much holier than initiation by a male. And yet, on a day-to-day -day level, women are considered lower than men and treated as less than human. Dr. Johannes Ogard is a professor at Aarhus University in Denmark. He is considered to be one of Europe's leading experts on Hinduism and its worldwide missionary movement. It's fair to say that according to Hindu doctrine, there's no salvation for women. Meaning that if women are to be saved, they have to qualify by serving the males in this life in order that they may be born as males in the next life. I had a conversation with a group of Hare Krishna female missionaries the leader argued without the slightest irony that the most foolish male is always more intelligent than the most intelligent female. In the religious communities in India, which are known as ashrams, there is absolutely no place for children. 
And here in the West, the gurus generally don't want the burden and responsibility of children because it distracts the parents from devotion to him and his cause. They have a school system whereby they force the children at age five to live in the ashram. A lot of the kids did think it was like a prison. They didn't get to go anywhere but the ranch. And while we were at school, it's really just a place for the kids to go to get out of the grown-up's way. And they separate them from the mother and father, which is very unfortunate and very destructive. Well, the kids would, would want to see their mom and dad, you know, just to be with them as a family. The kids wouldn't even know where their parents were, and they'd have to go look for them. And when they did, parents were usually too busy to talk to them. And so the kids were mainly by themselves and unsupervised. The most heartbreaking result of the guru invasion to the West is the damage and harm it brings to the children. Those who have no other choice than to live in the ashram because their parents have chosen to follow the guru. Separated from parents and cut off from outside relatives, they become community property. They lose their individuality and identity and are alienated from society. Pastor Friedrich Hock has written over 30 books on various cults and is Germany's leading expert on new religious movements. Children brought up in a cult are only educated to follow the commands of their leaders. They never experienced freedom. They never experienced a responsible life where they could have their own choice, where they could follow their will. I've had these children to uh, taken them to parks and they've seen normal people and they'd recoil in fear from them because they don't look like devotees, they, the men don't have shaven heads or robes. I didn't want to leave the ranch, I'd rather stay there because I was scared of the people outside of it. Because, I don't know, you just got a feeling down there, so you were worked in to staying there. Now why would an organization want to disrupt families like that? My own understanding in the cult dynamic is that it's a principle of control, divide and conquer. According to the Guru Gita, one of Hinduism's most important scriptures, the follower must not only adore and worship the Guru as God, but surrender himself and all his possessions as well. Most of the Gurus that I know of in the West are super rich. Gurus are more interested in white disciples than in Indian disciples, largely because they get more money from the whites. Rob, former transcendental meditator for 13 years, was a TM governor and in charge of teacher training at Maharishi International University. The TM movement is very wealthy. They have uh, land holdings all over the world. They have uh, beautiful hotels in Switzerland. They have uh, university campuses in the Midwest, they have academies on the East Coast, the West Coast. Here he was getting served on silver plates six times a day, sleeping on a very soft bed, riding around in a Mercedes. But supposedly he was so renounced that he wasn't attached to these things, so that gave him a right to enjoy them. Marsh made a statement that says, when the, wealth com when the money comes to me, he says it's transcendental. Money is our last priority. Everything else is our first priority. Hundreds of gurus have grown incredibly rich in the West through tax-exempt donations. And the manufacture and distribution of every kind of memorabilia honoring these self-proclaimed godmen. They have acquired vast land holdings, armed bodyguards, and outrageous luxuries from posh hotels to their own fleets of planes helicopters, and as in Rajneesh's case, 40 Rolls Royces. Why not Rolls Royces? Why have anything less? It's a capitalist country, and anything that produces or helps capitalism, why not? Anybody who says, why have Rolls Royce? I say, you're a communist. The guru's hypocrisy is diabolical. Criticizing the materialism and commercialism in the West and convincing their followers that non-materialism will get them up the spiritual ladder, these gods of the new age are laughing all the way to the bank. 
I know of groups involved in drug trafficking, smuggling, prostitution, and the buying and selling of weapons, all done to earn money for the guru. I know of a variety of uh, female disciples who were prostitutes in Bombay and making money with it. I have evidence that the Rajneesh organization is making a lot of their income through illegal trafficking of drugs into this country. If you have, have your head in the right place, you can create money. It is art. They were encouraged to smuggle dope from India to Europe, and from this money, they could pay their workshops. If they have to tell you they're with the Christian Children's Fund, or they're with the Salvation Army, or they're using the money to find men missing in action in Vietnam, whatever they have to do to get the money, they'll do that because they believe what their guru told them, that the end justifies the means. Hinduism teaches you to die to the voice of conscience inside that says, it's wrong. It teaches that there is no sin. This can be seen in the way that gurus and their disciples justify murder, violence, robbery, bribery, and crooked business transactions, all done in the name of heavenly deception. People were encouraged not only to spy on each other when they were not properly surrendering to the master. People were encouraged to lie to each other. The mail is censored. We know of bribery with local politicians. People undergo, as I did, a change in their value system and become confused about what is right and what is wrong. Another danger that you can see in a lot of the Eastern thinking is the sort of syncretism and the failure to make distinctions so that you d transcend not just right and wrong, but this and that. And I think it's very important to say there are distinctions, not just between right and wrong, but between all sorts of things, to think critically, to think clearly. The whole philosophy of Hinduism is very relative. There are no absolute moral standards upon which to act. Your feeling of right or wrong would change according to your level of consciousness. You can become so completely under the power of this particular person that you refuse to think, or if you like, you're unable to think you can lose the power to take decisions of any sort, no matter how trifling, in any area of your life. Sally Belfridge, former resident of Rajneesh's religious community in India, wrote of her disillusionment in her book, Flowers of Emptiness. I felt more and more kind of drawn into his, uh, his, this emptiness of his. It's impossible to describe. It's more than charisma. Charisma doesn't do it justice at all. It's more than an aura. I really believe that he knew something I didn't, that he was on a plane that I was not. They ask you for total and also brainless obedience and worship because they are God and they are more than human and you have to follow these gods. You are not asked to deal with your brain and to ask questions. I discover with amazement and dismay the readiness of people to submit. So many people in the world feel that they've got to fling themselves headlong and believe and give up their autonomy. People love to give up this heavy freedom that we have to carry with all the, the decisions and the effort it implies. Freedom in the East is freedom from individuality. So it's a detached freedom that has no high place of man. And a lot of the Eastern way of thinking is like a sort of mist that falls in, or it's been described as, a, as an embrace that smothers any differences. I found that I lost my identity somehow. He had no identity. He was a sort of conduit to the infinite. And I was somehow at the receiving end of something very strange and extraordinary. It is part of the world of illusion, and the goal is to withdraw and detach yourself from it. So there's no high view of, say, social action or compassion or an outraged concern to see justice in this world. On the contrary, if you do things like that, very often you're just tinkering with a person's karma. They believe that when a person suffers, that that is what he's due as a result of the law of karma, because you've done something very sinful in this lifetime or in a past lifetime, so there's very little compassion. One just was taught to ignore all of the dreadful, I mean, the intolerable poverty and suffering of India. There were beggars clustering around the gates of the ashram day and night 
children starving, living in little huts, surrounding what was supposed to be a religious community. The contradiction was disgusting to me, but most of the sannyasins failed to notice it. It appeared not to bother them in the least. Life is suffering. Therefore, you cannot escape suffering without escaping life. Interfering with suffering, entering into suffering, is totally ununderstandable for a real Hindu. I was a member of the Social Service League at the college, and we were trying to do what we could to help people in the villages. A gentleman who was head of the department of Hindi came around to us and said, why are you doing this? These people who are suffering in the villages, sick or diseased or whatever, have come to earth in this state because they have done something wrong in their past lives. Now, no matter what you do to them, if you cut short their suffering in this life, what will happen is they will simply come back in their next life in the same state or a worse state. So you're really wasting your time. Suffering is there, and you can't do anything about it but you can meditate yourself away from suffering. We feel that the cause of suffering is within, and so to allow people to experience peace themselves, we teach courses in meditation. They seek to escape suffering by numbing their emotions and compassion through meditation. Maharishi, TM's guru, once said that a hungry person can become a happy hungry person through practicing meditation. Humanitarian activities are again, by principle, foreign to Hinduism. When they are found within Hinduism, it is a direct influence from the Christian missionary movement, a sort of imitation of Christian missionary activity. Contrast, say, part of the Eastern view with the Christian view. One of the stories I've heard that meant a lot to many people is the story of the Zen poet Isa in the 17th century. He lost all five of his children and then his wife, whom he greatly loved. And each time one of them died, he went to the Zen master and said, now how can I take this? And the master said, always remember the world is due, DW. In other words, the sun rises, the dew disappears. Don't get hassled, don't involve yourself in mourning and grief. And he went home and wrote what became his most famous poem. And transliterated into English, it goes like this. The world is due, the world is due, and yet, and yet. In other words, the world is due, there's the logic of Buddhism. And yet, and yet, the humanness, which is not satisfied or fulfilled because it wants more of an answer than that. Now, you compare that, say, with Jesus, who face to face with death, was not detached or uninvolved. He was angry and he wept. Why? Because death is outrageous. God didn't make the world like this. Something's out of joint, something's wrong. And the Christian view sees evil and death as the wrong they are, and therefore fights them. And that's what the East lacks. In the Christian tradition, the suffering is taken so seriously that God himself had to enter it and take it upon himself. Without this taking upon himself the suffering of mankind, there is no Christianity. That's the heart of Christianity. Although the Hindu tries to convince himself that suffering is only in his mind, an illusion as he calls it, Maya, at the same time he believes that he has to suffer again and again by forever being forced to return to this world through reincarnation. There is no escape from this endless wheel of samsara, life and death, because in Hinduism, unlike Christianity, there is no forgiveness because there is no sin. Therefore, sadly, also, there is no hope. All the gurus that I know of in the Western world teach reincarnation, a doctrine very central to Hinduism. Reincarnation is all about dying and coming back to this world in one form or the other. Hare Krishna people believe in transmigration of the soul, as they prefer to call it, traveling from body to body to body. These physical bodies don't last forever, even though the soul does. So in the same way that a driver needs to change cars, in the same way we need to change from one body to another. Gandhi called reincarnation a burden too great to bear. Yet it is being eagerly embraced in the West in diluted form, as part of a patent blend of Hinduism and Zen Buddhism, camouflaged with psychological terminology. This New Age religion is promoted through thousands of worldwide networks and hundreds of major gatherings, such as this Mind-Body-Spirit Festival held in Los Angeles. 
It is a westernized version of India's Kumbh Mela and promotes many of the same gurus and practices from astrology and palmistry to psychic readings, healings, and meditations. The festival, now international, was started in London in 1977 by Graham Wilson. He explains the New Age interpretation of reincarnation as an upward evolution to a higher species of mankind. Um, we don't just reincarnate uh, as an individual soul into a new body each time, but uh, more of the, there's a collective consciousness of souls, which is why I think we have access to a lot more information than we realize. Either one has to believe in reincarnation or resurrection. They both could not be true at the same time. There are those who believe that Jesus was a reincarnation of Krishna or Buddha or some other great master of the past, but the Bible would absolutely refute that. Until the early 60s, only an elite few in the West believed in reincarnation. Today, this belief is accepted by nearly 25% of Americans and about 50% of Europeans. Likewise, yoga was once practiced mainly by an occultist clique in America and Europe. Now, over 19 million Americans and millions more in Europe are actively involved in some kind of Eastern meditation. Altogether, 60 million Americans have incorporated Eastern philosophies into their worldview. The Bible teaches that Jesus came once and for all. When he died, he did not reincarnate, he resurrected. It is appointed unto all men to die once, and after death comes the judgment, the judgment of God. I noticed that in the Western world, reincarnation has become something of a fad. However, in India and in Asia as a whole, reincarnation is certainly not a fad, it is a form of punishment. This circle of life and death, dying and living, is a horrible understanding. It is understood as a horrible concept within Hinduism because the only aim of the Hindu religiosity at its core is to get out of this circle, to escape this endless living and dying. And the means to get out of this circle of suffering is yoga. Yoga goes all the way back to the Hindu god Shiva who is called Yogeshvara, meaning Lord of Yoga. You find yoga being taught in several of the major Hindu scriptures. Krishna, one of the many Hindu gods, was an advocate of yoga. Yoga is also mentioned in the Gita as the main means to attaining salvation. The word means basically to yoke, union. The goal of the Hindu is to be yoked with Brahman. Brahman is the Hindu concept of God, the all or the absolute. Yoga, in its many westernized forms, is also at the heart of the New Age movement that has adopted Hinduism's basic beliefs and goals. In spite of the seeming variety and hundreds of competitive schools of yoga, all forms come out of India and lead into the occult, though most Westerners are not aware of this. Yoga techniques include breathing exercises, or prana, positions called asanas, dissolving the mind, known as laya, psychic powers called siddhis, repetitious chanting, named mantra, and deliberately cultivating black magic, known as tantra. In my extensive travels in India, I have encountered a number of Westerners who have got into Hinduism and begun following Hindu gurus as a result of a very simple initiation into a yoga class. Yoga is in many ways the heart of Hinduism. There is no Hinduism without yoga, and there is no yoga without Hinduism. Although there are many types of yoga, the one most familiar in the West often passes for physical exercise and is called Hatha Yoga. It promises mental and physical health, but its Hindu roots and real goal to yoke with Brahman are seldom taught. Ellen believes that Raja Yoga, or Yoga of the Mind, 
is the highest form of Hinduism. The Brahma Kumari's Raj Yoga is a form of meditation where the soul begins to understand itself clearly and has a connection with the Supreme Being. Raj means royal and yoga means union, so the link with the Supreme Being. And through this yoga, I become the ruler over my own self, over my mind and my life. Johanna Michelson, former yoga teacher and assistant to a psychic surgeon, tells of her experiences in the occult in her autobiography, The Beautiful Side of Evil. Another word for mantra is charm, or to cast a spell, if you will. And in mantra yoga, a word or a phrase or the name of a, a demon god is repeated over and over and over again to bring the individual to a vibration level that will attract that which is being chanted for, to bring about the desired effect. It's exactly what the white witches and magicians, so-called, use in the casting of their spells. We were always told, no, it's just a, mean, a meaningless sound. It had nothing to do with Hindu gods. But every time a person would sit down, they'd be invoking a Hindu god by thinking that mantra over and over again, be stronger in their life. Om Namo Narayana, Om Namo Narayana, Om Namo Narayana. It's just one of them. <laughs> goes Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare 108 mantras is one round and they chant that 16 times a day that takes two hours to do every day that's the minimum requirement the guru exacts from them thereby the mind or the brain is emptied and you get a clear mind as they call it a thoughtless mind it's sometimes referred to as a hypnotizing or brainwash technique because whenever you're having a problem or running into some confrontation, you retreat to the security of the chanting instead of thinking a problem through. George Harrison of the Beatles made mantra yoga acceptable to the world through his song, My Sweet Lord, where he incorporated the chant to a Hindu god, Hare Krishna, simultaneously with the biblical shout of praise, Hallelujah. He said he did this deliberately to show that both religions are the same and to make Hinduism more acceptable. To pretend that all religions are the same is dishonest, as is the merger of various religious techniques. For instance, more and more Christians use the name Jesus much like a mantra they claim that it's a tool to get them into the presence of God. Jesus said that repetitious prayer is not acceptable to God. Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, originator of TM, claims to have put Eastern meditation on the mystical map. With over three million followers, TM is the largest guru movement ever to invade the West. The Beatles' much publicized visit to Maharishi's community in India in the 60s convinced their millions of fans that TM, the so-called scientific yoga, was an even more powerful way to bliss consciousness than drugs. What makes TM unique and uh, different from any other practice that's going on today is that it offers enlightenment very quickly. Or it offered a, a, jet, a jet ride, you might say, to uh, self-realization. I started experiencing being lost in this state of awareness called the absolute. In essence, Maharishi taught that we all come from that nothingness and that is the source of all our consciousness, of all of our thinking and everything we do. Maharishi's primary thrust is the marketing of his Siddhi Yoga, which is designed to develop psychic powers such as levitation. These courses, like most guru programs, cost thousands of dollars. Rob was able to finance his advanced training through government student loans, totaling $6,000. During these uh, sessions, it's a very strange environment. People speak in tongues, they yell and they scream, they talk in foreign languages. It's like a madhouse, and it's real crazy. Everyone bouncing around on foam pads, flying up in the air. Rajneesh is one of India's most controversial gurus, largely because of his endorsement of shocking sexual practices as a prerequisite for salvation.
His brand of yoga called dynamic meditation is a new age combination of Hinduism and psychotherapies. This exercise involving rigorous breathing and hyperventilation is designed to arouse the serpent force called Kundalini, which the gurus believe lies coiled at the base of the spine. I did dynamic meditation every day. We also called it Kundalini meditation. It starts off with a cathartic breathing, and the reason for it is just to move your energy and to get you out of your head and into your body, and you just breathe. phase, the screaming phase of dynamic meditation feels like when you finally had an opportunity to throw a tantrum when you were a little kid. By the time you get to the third phase of jumping up and down and yelling who, you're hardly there at all. And so it's pretty hard to remember what happens when you're there. I guess the closest thing I can associate it with is mindlessness. You get to a place where your mind actually leaves your body. Your body's just jumping up and down and your voice from your gut is yelling who, and you're not doing it anymore. You become one with this whole energy. phase in dynamic is a quiet space. Someone yells stop and you've just been doing 30 minutes of intense catharsis and what happens after being in such incredibly intense movement for so long is just a feeling of peacefulness and stillness. My mind actually stops and I feel a oneness with the whole universe. There have been glowing reports published giving credit to the gurus and their pseudo-psychological techniques, but neglecting to mention the thousands of cases of emotional and mental breakdowns, insanity, suicide, beatings, murder, rapes going on in guru centers, various guru centers worldwide. It is alarming to realize these dangerous techniques for enlightenment are being incorporated in psychotherapies, self-help seminars, and are even being accepted in mainstream Protestant and Catholic churches and seminaries. <laughs> 